I've spent hundreds of hours in product discovery. I've shipped dozens of products in my career. And what I wanna do in this video is package all that up, package up a decade worth of experience into an introduction to product discovery. I wanna cover things like what product discovery is, the core components of product discovery and cover a really simple and lightweight way that you can get started with product discovery. For those new here, my name is Ant Murphy. I'm a product coach and the founder of Product Pathways. Productpathways.com is where you can find content like this, some free templates and resources, self-paced courses, and a community that is coming soon, maybe out, depending on when you're watching this video. So a bit of a spoiler alert, but it is all designed to help people like you master product management. Okay, let's get into discovery. So if you clicked on this video, you likely don't need any convincing on the value of product discovery, but I wanna start with just defining what product discovery is, talking about how I view product discovery, just so we can get everybody on the same page. So what is product discovery? To put it simply, product discovery is about de-risking through learning. When we start a new idea or an opportunity, there's a high number of unknowns, there's a high degree of uncertainty, and therefore there is a high degree of risk. What we then do in product discovery is we apply research techniques to learn more before we start building anything in order to de-risk. So as we learn more, we will uncover more information, we'll have more inputs into making a decision, and therefore we de-risk ourselves by reducing the number of unknowns, by reducing the amount of uncertainty, and we increase essentially confidence, which is the flip side of it and how I like to frame discovery. It's a confidence building exercise. To make this really real for you, they like to say that the most expensive way to learn if a product idea will be successful or not is to go ahead and build it. And I wanna give you a real example of this. So I wanna introduce a company that you've probably never heard of, and it's called Jusiro. So Jusiro was founded back in 2013, and they raised a whopping $120 million to solve this problem. The problem was making fresh juice. Now, if you ever tried to make fresh juice before, it's not something that you can do in the two to three minutes that you have between back-to-back -back meetings. It takes time, you need to wash the fruit and vegetables, you've got to peel them, you've got to slice them, you've got to prepare them, and all of this takes time. 20 minutes later, you've finally blended yourself some fresh juice. There's a mirage of other problems in it. You've got to buy a blender, it makes a mess, you've got to clean it. There's also issues around the fact that fruit and vegetables are perishable goods. If you're anything like me, for some reason, Every single time I buy a box of strawberries, there's like one strawberry down the bottom in some weird corner, growing its own ecosystem. And before you know it, the whole strawberry container is infested and I've got to throw my strawberries away, right? There's a lot of waste in this process. So plenty of meaningful problems, and especially in a world where we're having an increased focus on health and fitness, you can see how this could be a viable thing to invest in. And what they ended up producing was this. It is a nearly $700 Wi-Fi connected QR code scanning iPhone app connected machine. And what it can do is it can produce juice, fresh juice in a matter of minutes, no waste, no more storing and cutting and washing fruits. You put this little packet in to the device, it presses it, and in a matter of minutes, you get fresh juice out the other end. They even had a clever business model behind this. So not only did you have to buy the machine, they then also had a subscription service. So you can think of this as like the juice version of the modern day Nespresso. So what they would do is for $35 a week, you could get a week's worth of healthy juice packets sent to you. These packets would work exclusively with their $700 machine and boom, you've got reoccurring revenue, lifetime value. You have to buy these packets, you use them, fresh juice, and you keep coming back and there's a revenue and a business model there, right? The problem that they had was the fact that they built a $700 machine that no one needed. Yes, that is right. They built a machine that no one needed. There was this famous Bloomberg video that went around that showed that you can take one of the Jusiro packets and you could squeeze it with your hands in roughly the same amount of time it takes to juice the Jusiro juicer crazy air spaceship machine to crush it, you can squeeze your own juice out of that packet. And the end result was this, a company founded in 2013 ended up closing its doors in 2017 after having a live product in market for only 16 months. And this is a great example of what we're trying to avoid with product discovery. 
The most expensive way you can find out whether your idea is successful or not is to build it. That cost Jusiro and its founders $120 million to learn that lesson. So let's get into some of the core components of product discovery. And the first question you're probably asking yourself is if it's all about gaining confidence and de-risking, what are we de-risking against? So in product, we often talk about three big risks. We talk about desirability, which is like, well, do people even want it? Do they like it? That type of stuff. We talk about feasibility, which is like, technically, can we actually do this? Is this actually feasible? And we talk about viability, which is, does it work for our business? Does it, can we make money off it? Or can we sustain it in some sense? Cause I know not everybody's in a company that is, you know, for profit or profit driven government organizations, that type of stuff. But we're really asking ourselves, does it work for us as a business? Does it work for our stakeholders? And can we sustain it into the future? Now we want to try and de-risk some of these things again as cheaply and as quickly as possible because one of the things that we want to do in product discovery is also weed out the bad ideas. So we don't want to spend $120 million on an idea that we could find out in a couple of weeks is probably not going to be feasible or probably not going to be viable or customers don't even want it, right? Now when we talk about these three risks, we often you know visualize it like this as a Venn diagram. And sometimes we also break out some little subcategories here. Some people like to break out things like valuable, like calling out its actual core value. Some people like to break out usability and actually say like that it's actually usable. Uh, I think sometimes some of these things are actually worthwhile doing. Uh, also on the viabilities, often we also want to break out things like, is it ethical to do? And I've even worked in some places where they've wanted to also break out things like sustainability, right? Is it is it sustainable for the environment, for the planet? Can we look at circular economies, those types of things? And really at the end of the day, the way that I view this is it's really these three big buckets and those things are subcategories. But if you find value in actually breaking those things out, then absolutely go for it. But we're talking about all of those things. now. Stay tuned to the end because when I start to walk you through how you can get started with product discovery, I'm going to take you through how we can think about breaking this down and trying to uncover what types of risks we have and how we can actually then go about testing it and doing research around gaining more information on each of these things. But this is one of the core components of discovery is we're basically de-risking against these three core pillars. Now, the second component of product discovery is the fact that we need to do this across two key spaces. The first space is the problem space, and the second space is the solution space. Now, I like to visualize it like this, not as like two things. You might have seen this before as like the double diamond, where the first diamond's problem space, the second diamond's solution space. I don't think that's a correct representation. I much prefer this one because the reality is you're always testing the problem space throughout the whole process. And to a degree, you're also always testing the solution space. Again, remember we got feasibility in there and we also got viability in there. I don't believe that there's actually a point in time where we, we kind of click over. So I think of it more as these two wedges. I don't think of them as mutually exclusive things that we can kind of tick off problem and move into solution. So I like to visualize it like this. Uh, and this is a good mental model for me because it's like, well, where am I Where am I in this spectrum? Am I early on that I should be more focused on problem if I'm later on, I'm more focused on solution, but I should never think that, you know, I can tick a box and say the problem is validated and we can start to ignore it from then on. The reality of product is this, an amazing solution that doesn't solve a key problem for a customer or is not viable as a business is essentially wasted shelf space, right? We saw this with Jusiro, right? Great solution, not viable, not really desirable either because I can just squeeze it with my hands. Why would I pay $700? Equally, you can solve a really important problem for people, but if you do it in a very poor way, it's also not going to lead to desirable outcomes because your solution might be so bad that I'm willing to live with the current problems that I have. It might not actually be worthwhile taking it up. So these two things aren't mutually exclusive. You need to have a great solution that solves a meaningful problem. You can't just solve a meaningful problem and you can't just deliver a great solution. And again, this is the reason why I visualize it this way. Now, the way that this looks, just to make this a little bit more tangible for you, so you can really kind of see what I'm talking about here, 
Early on in the process, because we're much more focused on the problem space, we're going to do activities that look more like market analysis. We might do some competitive analysis. We might interview customers or observe them because what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand, is this a problem for them? Or we might even just be trying to explore the problem space. So we're like, what problems do you have? So I just want to observe you. I want to just see what's happening in your day to day. I might want to ask you a series of questions because I'm gathering information about what do you do and what problems do you face? Now, if we are doing anything on the solution front, and what I mean by that is if we're trying to prototype anything, at this point in the puzzle, because again, we're more focused on the problem than the solution, we want to minimize the investment there. So we're really doing kind of paper prototypes, back of the napkin type prototypes. We might do some small proof of concepts. We might do some small prototyping just to see if the technology is going to work or something like that. But again, we're really early stage in the problem space. Now, as time progresses and we move through this process, of course, we will start to invest more into the solution space and we'll start to add fidelity there. We'll go from paper prototypes to more digital paper, like prototypes, like maybe it's a digital version of it. We might go into um, something that is more colorful, that's not just boxes and wireframes. We might turn it into a clickable prototype. And then eventually, right at the very end, we might start to do things like A-B testing and actual like live versions and you know, starting to scale things out to alpha groups and beta groups. And then we're really high investment there. But we don't want to go there straight away because unless we have confidence in the problem space, we'll be investing a lot into something that we're not even confident there's a problem to be solving there. And I also just question, how are you going to design the solution if you don't understand the problem space well enough? So this is an example of how this starts to look real. And in UX terms, we often refer to this as moving up the fidelity ladder. So we start very low fidelity early on and we increase fidelity as we go. Equally, from a user interview and point of view, early in the puzzle, we might not have anything to show them. We're doing observations, we're asking them questions. And then over time, those questions will turn into more user testing because we'll start to actually have prototypes and stuff to put in front of them. Let me tell you a story here to make this a little bit real and tangible and just to illustrate why you want to move up the fidelity ladder and you don't want to invest too heavily early on. And also to show that when you're early on, you are more in the problem space and what this looks like. So I was involved with a project that was for a fuel company. So they had a bunch of service stations or gas stations, wherever you, wherever you are and what you call them. Uh, and they basically were asking us to look into a problem space. I worked at an agency at this time, a product development agency, and I was part of a small team and we got tasked to look into this problem space for them. So the problem space was as follows. Not every service station is suitable for very large trucks. Now, the most hilarious thing that most of you have probably seen is that not all service stations are high enough or tall enough for trucks and they take the roof off. Other key problems are not all service stations uh, have the space to even maneuver, maneuver into that petrol station. So if you're a really large truck, you would have a hard time. It might even be impossible for you to actually get into that service station. But even more deep than that, there's other things, right? There's things like high flow diesel, so filling up a truck that's got hundreds of liters or gallons, wherever you are, that takes a lot of time. And one of the ways fuel stations help with that is they have truck only pumps that have high flow diesel that makes it faster for them. Even then it can still be 10, 15 minutes for them to fill that truck up. So some service stations don't have high flow diesel and they're gonna be there for like half an hour to fill it up. Now they might also be missing amenities, right? Because while they're waiting, they might want a coffee, they might want to go to the bathroom, all that type of stuff. So this is a problem, which is not all fuel stations are suitable for trucks. And essentially the hypothesis was, maybe we could do something. We got a whole bunch of data about all of our service stations and how high they are and whether they have high flow diesel and what amenities they have. Maybe we could you know, make that data available and we could help truck drivers with that data, especially if they're having difficulty trying to find a service station. So rather than just rushing in and building a prototype, we're right at the beginning of the journey, right? So problem space. We decided to start out with going out there and interviewing a bunch of truck drivers and observing them. So we went out to a fuel station that's actually near the airport in Sydney. Uh, it's predominantly trucks only. It's, it is trucks only. Uh, and that's a perfect way to place to go. And while they're waiting 15 minutes to fill up their petrol, we can ask them a series of questions. We can see them in their environment, inside the truck, and we can learn more about their lives, about truck driving, and more about this problem space. Now, to cut a very long story short, 
essentially we uncovered a number of things, but one of the key things that we uncovered was the fact that we did we just didn't have confidence that this was a problem that was worth solving. The reasons why we didn't have confidence in this idea was because the majority of truck drivers, as we found out speaking to them, they drive the same route every day. And therefore they know what service stations to stop at and what service stations to not stop at. And if they are doing a different route, normally there's a handover period where they ride that route with the current truck driver who does that route and they do a handover. So it's not like they do the route for the first time by themselves. They actually do it with another driver and that driver can give them all the like tips and tricks. Now, obviously we asked them, surely this happens occasionally, right? Like sure, okay, I understand it might not happen that often, but you've got to run into this issue every now and then. There's roadworks or a petrol station is burnt down or something, right? Something must happen. And we asked them like, what do you do in this situation? And a piece of context here that's useful is the fact that in Australia, we have really tight mobile phone laws while, while driving. Not mobile phone laws in general. We, we have them while using your phone while driving. As a result, the truck drivers are very conscious of this because their license is their livelihood. It is their job. It is you know, food on the table, roof over the head, right? So they're very mindful of this. What turns out to be not illegal and completely legal is using the old CB radio inside the truck. So most of the truck drivers told us that they would just jump on the CB radio, they will ask the trucker network for some help and somebody would respond to them and give them directions and basically guide them to a, a you know, a next suitable petrol station because truck drivers drive those roads all the time. Somebody else might've run into the issue already and they've solved it and they're willing and happy to share that information on. And they are conscious to not use their mobile phones while driving, not too much at least. And they can, they're completely comfortable using a CB radio because that's legal and trying to use your mobile phone unless, you know, we've got some really strict laws. I'm not going to get into it. Um, yeah, can be illegal, right? So they would much prefer to use the CB radio. I think there's an element of habit there and comfort. And there was a bunch of other things that we uncovered, but essentially those things combined along with a few other things meant that we didn't have confidence in the idea. And what we achieved by doing this was just spending a couple of weeks on product discovery and literally going out there and talking to a bunch of truck drivers for one day. And we had enough information to basically make a decision and say, we don't think this is a viable thing to actually go down and actually try and pursue. And this is the point of discovery. And I illustrate this because I often see this in companies all the time where they're doing discovery, but it really is the like second half of what I've drawn here. It's a lot of prototype and user testing. And what they're neglecting is this early part, which is the problem space. So this is a really key thing and a really key principle and a really key component of discovery to keep in mind. That brings me to the third component of product discovery. And that is the famous double diamond. I mentioned the double diamond before and why I don't like to visualize the double diamond this way. And I'm gonna get a little bit more into why I just don't like the double diamond in general. But why do I mention the double diamond? Well, I mentioned the double diamond because a core component and a very key component of discovery is this notion of diverging and converging. So through the process of discovery, we want to make sure that we are having adequate time to diverge and converge and then diverge again and then converge. Now, the reason why I don't like the double diamond is because again, it's not so simple as diverging once and converging and diverging again and converging. What you will actually find in product discovery is you will go through a series of divergence and a series of convergence. And you'll do that at a very macro and a very micro level. Without going too deep into this and trying to break your brain, the important component and the important lesson that I wanna illustrate here is that through discovery, we wanna make sure we diverge and we wanna make sure we converge. This is absolutely critical to innovation. There's a lot of research around innovation uh, and creativity. And most of the research points to the fact that the first ideas that you think of and the conclusions that you come to very rapidly, immediately are often riddled with biases. There's some really simple activities that you can do uh, one of my favorite things to do in training to illustrate this is to do this activity where I basically get a bunch of circles and I get people to start drawing smiley faces. And you've essentially got like two minutes to try and come up with as many smiley faces as you want. They need to all be unique and you need to come up with different ones. And then I ask participants, which smiley face do you think is the most creative and the most innovative? And nine times out of 10, that 
smiley face is not in the first two rows. It's definitely almost never in the first row. And this is because over time, as we actually diverge is what we're doing here, we get more creative. We start to add things. We start to think outside the box. You know, I've had moments where they've started to challenge the circle altogether, right? And do different things and, and weird things, right? So this is what we want to do in discovery. This is how we come up with more creative and innovative ideas. And I know I'm laboring the point here, but I think this is a really key component. So we want to make sure we diverge and converge because the opposite of this is premature convergence. And this is what I was kind of alluding to when I talked about the problem and solution space. And I was talking about how I see companies jump into that solution space too quickly. That is premature convergence. That's essentially skipping the problem and converging on a solution and then starting to prototype that and user test that. Yes, that might help you uncover the problem because they might tell you that this is not valuable, like, oh, I wouldn't use it, that type of stuff, but you've prematurely converged and it means that you've already started to land on a potential solution and you've missed the opportunity of exploring other alternative solutions, which some of them might have led to better outcomes. So how does this look in practice? What well, this looks like a few things. The first one is trying to avoid that premature convergence. This happens on multiple levels. So premature convergence to a solution, but also premature convergence to a problem. That is assuming that we know the problem and we're like, this is the problem. And then we go to validate that problem. Rather than, again, trying to prematurely converge, what we want to do is take a few steps back and say, well, let's explore the problem space first. I agree that you're probably right that that's a problem. But before we go deep into that problem, let's just explore the edges first. Let's talk to some customers and let's try and understand them a little bit better. Let's understand what's going on in their lives and what's happening. And you never know, we might unearth a, a problem that we weren't aware of that might be a more important problem to solve. That is how it looks like in the earlier stages. In the later stages, it looks like things like ideation, making sure that we ideate multiple different potential solutions. And this is not a taxing thing either. Like ideation can be a 20 minute exercise. So just trying to come up with some alternative solutions. And even if you end up discarding them, it's worth just going through that exercise and that activity. If you want some ideation techniques, I wrote an article about seven of my favorite ideation techniques. I'll link that article in the description so you can go check that out. That is the core components of what great product discovery looks like. These are some of the mental models and the things that I want you to be thinking about when it comes to product discovery. Now let's talk about putting this all together and how do you get started with product discovery? How do I actually make sure that I'm diverging, converging? I'm making sure that I'm covering desirability, viability, feasibility, and that I'm de-risking. I'm gonna walk you through something that I've kind of been calling minimum viable product discovery with my clients. And what this is, is a really lightweight framework to get you started with product discovery. So the way that this works is we have to start somewhere. So we can start in multiple places here. Generally, early on in the process, we've probably got an outcome or we've got some type of problem to solve, right? And it's often quite a big problem, but this is our starting point. It's like, let's look into this space or let's try and achieve this goal, something like that. The first step we do is one of my favorite techniques. It comes from a person named David J. Bland. He co-authored a book, Testing Business Ideas, and that's where I first learned this technique, which is known as assumptions mapping. So an assumptions map is a two by two matrix that has importance on the y-axis. So this is low importance and then high at the top. And then it has evident or no evidence on this side and then evidence on this side. And the way that assumptions mapping works, and you can do this on a mirror board, you can do this on a whiteboard, you can do this in many different ways, is that we map out our assumptions. What are all the assumptions that we are making about this outcome problem? And I'll get to solution in a second. You can also do this on a solution a level as well. Just map out all of those assumptions. Now you can go and read about assumptions mapping. David J. Bland has a lot of content out there. There's a lot of content in general about assumptions mapping. I would also, if it's 
your kind of thing, get the book testing business ideas. Actually one of my most referenced book, I get zero kickback or any, no affiliation here. It literally is one of my most recommended and referenced book. I use it all the time. I look at it all the time. Uh, so it actually is a worthy investment from my perspective. I recommend it a lot. But they have a bit of more of a structured way to do this where you kind of walk through, you know, you start to think about like our desirability risks and assumptions, our feasibility risks and assumptions, our, our viability risks and assumptions. Uh, but if that structure is too much for you, just in general, thinking about what are our risks and what might go wrong and what are our assumptions that we're making here, that also works perfectly fine as an exercise as well. Now, we do assumptions mapping because it does a few things. The first thing it does is it helps us understand what assumptions we're making and therefore what risk do we have and what are the things that we, we know a bit about and what are the things we don't know a lot about, right? And what this does is it does a magical thing. You can probably already see what is, where it's going. Uh, it helps us prioritize because the things in the top right are often referred to as our riskiest assumptions. So you might have heard before that one of the things that we should be doing in discovery is testing our riskiest assumptions. And that's because the things up here that are high importance and we have little to no evidence on, they are the things that are unknown to us. We don't know. We don't have a lot of evidence on it. And they're really important. So if we're wrong about these things, then we might end up with a $120 million mistake like just zero, right? Now, what this does for us and this gets into my next part in the minimum viable discovery, is we essentially then end up with a prioritized list of assumptions. So priority, prioritized list. And I often refer to this as your discovery backlog. This is all of the things that we need to discover. Now, you want to prioritize from the top right, so you're going to start in the top right, but that doesn't mean that you might, that you only, you only, you know, test the things in the top right. Of course, you could touch these things as well. Like, you could also only do these ones. That's completely up to your discretion. I'm going to get into that in a little bit about how you can decide about that. But it's going to give you a prioritized list of assumptions that you need to test. Discovery backlog. Awesome. You know what you can do here too? You can actually create, you know, secret trick here. You could create like a Kanban board or something like that to, to manage your discovery work and track it. You know, it sounds crazy, right? That we could do something like that, but you can. Okay, sidebar. We now have a list of assumptions we need to test. The question becomes, what's next and how do we test them? This is where you need to then take that assumption. We need to take an assumption. We need to turn it into a hypothesis. And the hypothesis should describe how we're going to test it. Now, in the book Testing Business Idea, they have things like experiment cards. You can Google it. You can find those templates. Um, I've also got an experiment tracker board, which has a bit of a format. I'll add a link to those things in the description below as well. Um, so there are ways that you can frame this. But what I think is the most important thing here, and the if you're really just getting started and you don't want to get too complex here, all you need to do is look at the assumption and say, how might I learn more about this thing so I can gain more confidence? That could be as simple as I'm looking at this thing and maybe I should go and listen to some calls from some customers. You know, um, it could be something like maybe I should go talk to so-and-so to find out something. Maybe I just need to, maybe I can turn this into a question or a series of questions and I can go and interview a bunch of customers or do a survey or something like that and just get some more information. I will say this, especially for those who just started with uh, discovery, there can be a, a bit of a desire or an obsession and you might have other people, not me, tell you that the way you're testing is wrong or you know, don't use focus groups, do this. Yes. There are some research techniques that are better than others, but I'll tell you this, doing an imperfect way to test and get more information about your assumption and your hypothesis is better than 
not doing it. So whilst I know that there's better methods for you to do, potentially, depending on what you're doing and depending on your maturity level, especially if you're starting out, I'm probably going to be like, there's a better way to do this. But you doing something is better than nothing. And what's more important here is the fact that we're working through our assumptions and we're gathering some more data. Even if that data is a little bit imperfect and it could be better, that's better than nothing. So I'm happy with that. Over time, once you've got the reps in and you started to build this up and discovery is like a practice that you do all the time and you're really good at it, at that point in time, for sure, let's start to learn more about the methods you can use here. Let's start to become more of an expert in those methods. Let's you know, actually use different methods over time, learn where they're appropriate and when they're not appropriate. So then you can apply the right things. But as I said, I wouldn't stress too much about it. Now, some of you are thinking, well, what are all the ways that I can test it? I don't know what's available to me. I'll give you a few hints here. For starters, I created this cheat sheet for this exact reason. I basically categorized it underneath different the desirability, viability, feasibility. We actually separated usability. That was feedback that I actually got from using this with my clients. And I, I've also shared this publicly a few times as well. And, and usability was just a feedback that I got that um, people wanted that separated. I can see why and I'm okay with doing that. Uh, but here's a bit of a cheat sheet. So this just essentially shows you different tests that you can do. It's not exhaustive. There's definitely more out there, but they're just different ways that you can you can test things. I would encourage you to Google some of these if you're curious about them, learn about them. But I'll also say this for those getting started for the first time. You don't need to know a lot of methods. I'll tell you what I use the most. Interviews, talking to people, user testing, again, talking to people, but putting something in front of them. Um, Actually going and looking at data and analytics and dashboards is always something that we do. Surveys is something I do as well um, more often, probably in kind of these orders. Surveys I do less than interviews, that's for sure. Uh, many reasons for that. Uh, and then there's a bunch of other ones around, I mean, you could put A-B testing and stuff in there as well as, as something that's real, or multivariant testing that's really high up there. Advanced one though. But if you stuck with user testing with prototypes, user interviews, looking at data and the occasional survey, you'll be able to cover a lot of situations. And like I said, you could use these in order to test basically anything. And whilst there is a better method for whatever you're trying to test, it's probably sufficient enough and it's good enough to get started. So I, I, I just spend a little bit of time here because it's important. I don't want you to feel scared because a lot of people do. And this is why, this is how I teach minimum viable discovery or I teach discovery and get teams to do discovery for the first time. I'm trying to lower the barrier for you. You don't need to be too scared about it. If you just thought about those three things and was like, am I going to interview someone? Am I going to do a survey? Am I going to prototype test it? Am I going to try and look at some data and do some research there? As long as you're thinking about those buckets, you're going to cover most scenarios and you'll be okay. So now this may look like you're done, right? It may look like, oh, okay, I've done assumptions map. I've got a backlog. I'm turning those things into hypotheses and tests. I'm going and testing them. I'm getting some data. Not sh so fast. One more thing to add onto here, and that is to time box. This is important because I see too many teams do discovery forever. They spend like, not forever, but far too long. The amount of companies I've gone into and they've been doing discovery for six months, nine months on something, it's far too long. Again, you want to make this cheap. You want to make it quick. It's not going to be perfect. It's not a silver bullet. And remembering, we just need enough information to do a V1. And then whilst we have the V1 out in the wild and we're getting feedback there, we can continue to do more discovery and then build that V2 and then that V3. And this is known as continuous discovery and delivery where we we, we, we built something and whilst we're we're now discovering the V2 and we're getting feedback as well and incorporating that feedback and refining it. And then we build some more and we find some more. Yeah. If we work in that way, we don't need to make discovery go forever. So a way that we can avoid making discovery go forever is, is to time box discovery. Now to help you come up with a time box, I have adapted this from something that I've, uh, I actually learned it from a mentor of mine. And then later, a couple of years later, I took Jeff Patton's passionate product leadership course. And then I realized he learned it from Jeff Patton. Jeff Patton teaches it in the course. Jeff also adapted this from some other model. Can't remember the name of the model, but it looks like this. 
essentially, if you remember that discovery is about de-risking and it's about increasing confidence, on one dimension, you could say, how risky is this idea? Or the inverse of that would be, how much confidence do I have? And then on the other dimension, it's investment. And another way that you can think about investment is essentially, is just time. So on one axis, if something is really risky, so high risk, and that means low confidence, we should probably have a high investment of discovery in it, correct? And we end up referring to, or at least what we draw, Jeff draws is this kind of like sweet spot. It's a bit on a angle, but there's a sweet spot where there's a relationship between whether I have a high confidence in it and therefore low risk, therefore low to maybe zero discovery because it's so low risk, we're so confident we can just go and do it or maybe very little like a couple of days or a couple of hours or a couple of weeks or, or not a couple of weeks, like one week to the other end of the spectrum where it's something we have, it's very risky, like if we get this wrong, it's expensive, it's reputational risk, there's a whole bunch of other things in there. There's a lot of unknowns, so I'm not confident in this idea at all. Then we wanna do a high amount of investment. And if you think about the other zones that are in there, something that's high risk and low investment would be the stupid zone, as Jeff likes to call it. Uh, and then down here is how I like to frame it as overcooking right so you just are doing way too much discovery considering so this would be like low risk over here so you're doing way too much discovery for the amount of risk there is now i've actually adapted this into something that basically breaks down the investment and the time into sprints uh, i like to do the sprints because most teams are doing scrum and the following sprints and if you make your discovery time boxes follow your delivery time boxes it's just a win-win and everything works easily so we essentially on the investment axis, we have the number of sprints we want to invest into discovery. And then on the Y axis, we have essentially a confidence meter. How confident are we in this thing? Now, yes, these things are subjective. And yes, different people are going to have different confidence levels. And yes, that pesky stakeholder that just wants you to build it and not do any discovery is always going to say that they're a 10 out of 10 in terms of confidence. But this is not meant to be a perfect model. It's not meant to answer all your questions. It's meant to facilitate a conversation and make you think about if I'm a, you know, if I have a medium range of confidence, we'll say, then how much should I set on that time box? Like, should it be three sprints, which is six weeks, or should it be less? Or should it be, you know, should it be two? Should it be four sprints? Or should it be eight, right? It's just to get you to think about this. And what you want to do is pick a time box and you want to set that as an initial time box. Now, a few things can happen once you set that time box. Scenario number one is you get through your entire backlog, backlog depleted, right? That's scenario number one. In that case, if you get to that before the end of the, the, the time box, well, just stop doing discovery and Go back to your assumptions map, go back to the original problem space and look at it and be like, what, do we have enough information to make a decision? Remember the output of discovery is a decision. Now, scenario number two is that we either gain enough confidence or we lose confidence. Another way to think about this is we have enough confidence to make a decision. And that decision could be to bin the idea because we've lost confidence, or it could be to proceed. Now, we could get to that point before the end of the time box. Don't fill the time box if you don't need to. I've had this scenario happen to me in the past, um, and we actually did it as an agency. So we're getting paid, and we're meant to get paid for 10 weeks of discovery. And we got like four or five weeks in, and we had enough information, and we're like, hey, I don't think this is worth pursuing. And we went back to them and told them exactly that. It was like, you can keep the money. It's okay. It's, it's fine. It's not worth pursuing. Would you like us to look at something else in the couple a couple of weeks that we have that you're gonna pay us for, or would you happy to just like leave it at that? So that is a scenario. Another scenario is we get to the end of the time box. Now, at the end of the time box, the time box is not meant to be set in stone, rigid, 
that's it. The end of the time box is a reflection point. So when you hit the end of the time box, you need to take a step back. It's just a stake in the ground to reflect. Take a step back and look at your discovery backlog. Look at what you've learned so far and ask yourself, do we have enough information that we can make a decision here? Or do we need more information? And if we do need more information, let's go set another time box. So let's go back to this. Let's have a look at, well, where's our confidence? Because two things can happen here. You, you can go either way with the confidence meter, right? You could, you, you might want to set a bigger time box for the next time because you've lost confidence in this thing. You might want to just go, let's just do another week or another two weeks and let's just see how we're going. That's how I would tackle it. I would do another time box. Now, last thing to kind of piece all this together. At all of those cases, we are going back to the original problem space and what we started our journey on. We're going back to that assumptions map, which means that we can do a new assumptions map. We can update that assumptions map. We can also, we can also reframe the outcome of the problem. And this brings me into a crucial thing as well. Remember how one of the core components of discovery is problem space and solution space? This means that you might do all of this and your stuff on your assumptions map was all very much problem space focused. So you kind of do all this, you set an initial time box, let's say it was four weeks. You finish the four weeks, you come back to here and you look at this and you say, well, now that we've kind of like crossed some of these things off, I have a whole bunch of new assumptions, but these assumptions this time are all to do with the solution space and we might still have a few problem space ones in there this is again the reason why i don't like the the clean split but now you might have a whole bunch of new assumptions because now you're starting to like frame up and design and shape a potential solution but now we're like is this possible and is that possible and what you'll find is as you go through cycles of this and repetitions which i'm getting to in a minute you'll find that the things on your assumptions map will start off very problem spacey and over time it will follow these two triangles. They'll, you'll have less stuff on the problem space, you have more stuff on the solution space. Meanwhile, all the time covering those three key things of desirability, viability and feasibility. So what ends up happening is at the end of the time box, you may come back and you should come back to the beginning, do an assumptions mapping exercise again, Look at those assumptions, do another time box and do discovery again. And this is what continuous discovery looks like. And this is why I teach product discovery this way and why I've kind of coined this whole thing of minimum viable product discovery, because you can see how this works, how it's lightweight. And I'm not trying to teach you different things between different stages of discovery where I'm like, hey, in problem space, you've got to do this and then that and then that and all these, you know, you learn five different techniques for the problem space and then then you learn five new techniques for the solution space and then you're confused between mixing between them. Now there's a lot that we can go through inside product discovery. This is really only just scratching the surface, but I hope for those who are really trying to learn about product discovery for the first time and really getting themselves started with it, I hope that this video is useful for you, gets you some of the key components about it and just kind of gets you started. If you do want to learn more about product discovery, check out productpathways.com and also check out this video on the top here, where I talk about four common product discovery mistakes that I see teams make all the time. And I'm gonna throw a second video kind of maybe around here, hopefully somewhere, that is gonna go deeper into user interviews. So if you wanna learn more about user interviews, how to structure user interviews, how to do them effectively, watch that video. That's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you at the next one.